The death toll which keeps on rising, over 7,000 dead in the Turkey and Syria earthquakes. The desperate search for survivors goes on. In freezing weather and as aftershocks still hit, thousands of families are frantic and there is mounting anger at a lack of help. No one was here last night. The government workers went home. They just left us. So many are clinging to any sign of hope. Our cameras in Syria witness one remarkable rescue of a little boy from the depths of the rubble. As international teams scramble to get on the ground, we'll get the latest from the region, from Emma and Rachel, where Turkey's president has declared a three-month state of emergency. And closer to home, a huge effort to help is underway too. Charities and families across the UK are gathering supplies to send, some fearing the worst for their relatives. Even my mother is died, and then I want to cuddle her. I mean, I want to see her last time. In other news tonight... You brazenly raped and sexually assaulted many women, some you barely knew. 36 life sentences for former Met officer David Carrick after two decades of rapes and assaults of women. Rishi Sunak's reshuffle after a rocky few weeks, he attempts to take back control and... It's Molly! Wrexham's heroics, but is it enough to deliver a Hollywood ending in the FA Cup? This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. Through aftershocks, through tiredness and bone-chilling cold and through terrible grief, the people of southeastern Turkey and northern Syria keep digging and hoping. Help, national and international, is coming, answering those desperate muffled cries from under buildings, fallen and fractured by yesterday's earthquakes. Blocked roads and ruined runways mean it hasn't arrived yet, so they do what they can. Those muffled cries are fewer. The number of dead has reached more than 7,200 in Turkey and Syria. Well, in the dark and freezing temperatures, as you can see, the chances of finding someone alive are reducing by the hour. And yet 8,000 people have somehow been pulled alive from the mountains of rubble in Turkey. 24 hours on and a bleak dawn in Adana. The dark of the night fading to reveal scenes of the darkest human experience. Daybreak brought some hope and much horror. The light failing to banish the nightmare that's befallen the people of this broken city. My sister, brother-in-law and disabled nephew lived on the 10th floor, this woman told me. And no one is here to properly help search. There is growing frustration that trained search teams have not yet made it here. They will come, but that matters little when you know those that you love are beneath the rubble. No one was here last night. The government workers went home, this man shouted. They just left us. Two hours away in the city of Iskandaran, the search for the living and the recovery of the dead was also down to the efforts of those untrained in such dreadful work. With only the bedsheets in which they'd slept to protect the dignity of those who perished, they carried body after body away. The final loss of hope, almost too much for those who survived to accept. Dad, Dad, maybe he's still alive. Check his pulse, this daughter begs. Maybe he needs resuscitation. There aren't enough stretchers now to bring the dead from their temporary graves. In some parts of these buildings, they're finding so many bodies, they're having to take them out in the buckets of the diggers that are used to move away the rubble. People who lived their lives here being removed like this as their families watch on. Throughout the wreckage, the trappings of those lives remind of what's been lost. 
the keys still in a locked door. When they were last turned, they offered a protection against a different threat, but no protection against the threat that was coming. Others gathered what memories they could, salvaged photographs of different times. For some, the scenes they witness trigger memories they thought they'd left behind. Mohammed told me his home now looks like the one he fled in Aleppo. In this home, his brother was killed and his parents injured. We fled the war. If there was no war, we'd still be in Syria. The war is death and the death followed us here. Death reaches us everywhere. There have been rescues, even now, despite the cold. A lucky few being saved. She's stunned and disorientated, but alive. What joy for families and the rescue teams to save lives. Some respite in this bitter winter tragedy. But such relief is in short supply. Amid the aftershocks, the searches continue and the diminishing chance of survival does not deter. The wish to find any hardy soul clinging to life drives them on day into night. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Adana. Well, let's join Rachel now in the Turkish city of Diyarbakir, which has been badly hit by the earthquakes. Rachel, just terrible conditions we're witnessing in Emma's piece there. What are you seeing there tonight? Well, despite the fact it is bitterly cold, there are still people spending the night out on the streets, as you can see behind me, using blankets and makeshift fires to try and stay warm. Now, in this particular city, around 20 to 25 buildings came down. The rest was largely unscathed. But just have a look at the apartment blocks up there, and you'll see that there is barely a light to be seen on anywhere. And that is because this is a place that is still being hit by aftershocks. The last one at 10 o'clock this morning. And it means no one is sleeping, no one feels safe. Others are gathered in relief centres like this one behind me, where local charities are keeping them supplied with food, bowls of soup, blankets, just trying to keep them warm and safe. But the other reason that people have come to this particular spot is because of what is unfolding in front of us here. That pile of rubble you see was until 42 hours ago, a seven-storey apartment block. And in fact, if you look at the building behind it, that was its twin and is barely unscathed. Now, the rescue operation that has been going on here has proved to be pretty successful, particularly during the first 24 hours. They were able to get numerous people out and safely to hospital, but it is getting tougher and tougher with temperatures plummeting here. Just this morning, unbelievably, they managed to get a young woman out alive. They took her to hospital. They regularly stop the drilling here and call for silence. The whole place falls still. And in the past couple of hours, they have still heard cries coming from beneath the rubble. They believe there are still people alive there and they are desperately clinging to that hope. They are carrying on digging and drilling away here, even as the temperatures fall and that last bit of hope begins to ebb away. Let's hope they can keep it going as long as possible. Rachel, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, well, across the border in Syria, the earthquakes have wreaked destruction in both rebel and regime-held areas. In the town of Samada in Idlib province, one of those rebel-held areas, ground down by nearly 12 years of civil war, our cameras did manage to film one moment of hope. The search is now for the dead as well as the living. A block of flats crushed by the quake. Surely no one has survived. But the rescue workers are hopeful. And in the rubble, there are signs of life. A closer look, then a call for help. There's someone down there. Under the light of their head torches, the face of a boy is revealed. He's lying still, and the search teams fear the worst. Until they see the flicker of his eyes, the shift of his head. Ropes and cables are brought in, and he's lifted from the debris to safety. He looks around, searching for his loved ones as he's taken to hospital.
He mutters a few words. Bring me some water, he says. His hand is trembling. His voice is weak. His name is Muaz and he's eight years old. And then a question to silence the hospital ward. Where's my mum, he asks. The answer isn't clear and no one can provide one yet until a surviving member of his family arrives. Do you recognize me? I'm your uncle, he says. God bless you. It later becomes clear that his mother is alive. But soon he will also learn that his father, his sister and his brother were killed. At the apartment block from which Muaz was rescued, the search went on, but this is now becoming a recovery mission, an infrastructure stretched by 12 years of civil war. And for a boy who has always known the pain of that conflict and now the destruction of an earthquake, the greatest trauma might be ahead when he learns that not everyone made it out safely. Rohit Katru, News at 10. Well, when Turkey was hit by another large earthquake in 1999, 18,000 people were killed then. New construction methods were meant to have been brought in to limit the damage when it happened again, which, Emily, was only a matter of time, the quakes they've been dreading. Mm, absolutely. And in many ways, there's no surprise that an earthquake of this magnitude hit in this part of the world. It's an earthquake hotspot, and sadly, they are to be expected. Turkey and Syria sit at the crossroads of four tectonic plates. And for years, the Anatolian and Arabian plates have been pushing against each other horizontally across what's known as a strike-slip fault. On Monday, the stress built up so much, it caused the deadliest earthquake seen in recent years. And it wasn't just felt along the fault line, but for hundreds of miles around. Geologists think the stress from the first quake triggered the other massive quake. The impact was colossal. The quake's epicentre was in Gaziantep. From there, the devastation was spread across 10 provinces in Turkey, where more than 13 million people live. In Karamanmarash, most of the city centre has been destroyed. In Adiyaman, several government buildings collapsed. And the airports of Malatia and Hatay were badly damaged. Across the border in Syria, it was also devastating, with around 10 million people affected in the area. That includes about 4 million internally displaced refugees in Syria's last opposition region around Idlib. But why was the damage so great? Well, unsurprisingly, it was one of the biggest hit to hit on land and occurred at a shallow depth, only 11 miles deep. So it was pretty close to the surface and near populated areas. Buildings should, of course, be reinforced to help withstand a shock, but thousands collapsed. And look at this. Look what happened in 1999 when a 7.6 magnitude quake struck Turkey. Shockingly similar scenes. There have been efforts to prevent this, something called pancake collapse, where tragically, few people survive, but there are questions over whether new building regulations are actually being enforced. And this matters because it will happen again. And sadly, Julie, scientists have no way of predicting when or precisely where. OK, Emily, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, thankfully, help is on its way from the UK to Turkey and Syria. Nearly 80 specialist firefighters and staff will be deployed there. Money is being raised and winter clothes are being collected by Turkish communities and others besides. Some, though, already know that it is too late for their loved ones. Help is coming from every part of the UK. In Nottingham, they're packaging up supplies ready to send to those who need it most. Ali is the organiser. He lost six relatives in the earthquakes back home, but he's convinced these donations will make a difference. What we can do here is, is probably more effective than what we can be there. 
Unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get the um, plane ticket to fly out there to reach my family yesterday, but at least we're here. What we can do is uh, send some warm clothing, send some money to them that, so that they can buy the, the, the goods and uh, food, etc. that they, 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 they most need. Ishil's mum is missing. Uh, this is our flat. She thinks her mother is trapped in what's left of her home. They last spoke at the weekend. It's fine. I'm happy because I talked to her. But it wasn't enough. Before, before even my mother is died, and then I want to cuddle her. I mean, I want to see her last time. The wait for news is frustrating for Abdullah in Middlesbrough. He's lost 16 members of his family and three are still missing. They are on the, uh, under the buildings, uh, but we don't know they, they live or not. But uh, the weather conditions uh, are also very uh, bad. Uh, it's very uh, difficult. In North London, the donations are still coming in. Hundreds of people turning up with arms full of aid. We have bought lots of nappies, wipes, blankets, shoes, coats, jumpers. We bought food, we bought lots of newborn stuff, we bought lots of baby formula. Yesterday we found out um, a few of our relatives are basically out in the snow so they can't sleep or they're in the cars. Um, they can't get food or anything because petrol stations, shops have all closed as well. Surviving on biscuits and what bare minimum that they've managed to basically pick up just before the earthquakes. It might only be a box of cereal, a bit of pasta and some wipes, but this aid effort is bringing communities together, turning their grief into some good. Stacey Foster, News at 10. Well, for a worrying 24 hours, it looked as though the earthquake might have claimed the life of the former Newcastle United and Chelsea forward Christian Atsu. He's been playing for a Turkish side, but this morning he was reported found. Atsu's team is based in southern Turkey. He was pulled out alive from a building that was brought down. He's been taken to hospital with injuries to his foot and breathing problems. Two of his teammates escaped unhurt, thankfully. Well, let's go back to Emma now, who is in Adana tonight. Uh, Emma, good evening to you. We're hearing of massive international aid operations that are supposed to be swinging into action. What are you seeing on the ground? Well, those operations are swinging into action. It's just taking quite a lot of time to get them to these pockets, places like this, where they don't have professional search and rescue teams. They've just got civilians who are here giving up their time, trying to help in any way they can. Companies donating the diggers so that they can actually try and move some of this heavy rubble. And all this is going on at the same time as even in the last hour, we've had reports of multiple small earthquakes across the country. So it is incredibly challenging, but the help is coming. It, just must be so hard though for people who have family members missing and they see this situation and think where are the real experts when it comes to finding people. Yesterday we travelled from Istanbul down here and I have to say that the airport was full of Turkish search and rescue experts as well as those from many many countries. The plane was full of German, Spanish and Russian search and rescue teams who were coming here with their dogs, with their sonar and all that kind of absolutely crucial equipment. It will get here it just is going to take time, and time is such a frustrating commodity for people here at the moment. Indeed, Emma, thank you very much indeed for that. To the day's other news now, and in front of some of the women he attacked, the serial police rapist David Carrick was sent to jail for a minimum of 30 years. He was given 36 life sentences for rapes, assaults and other crimes that went unpunished for 17 years. The judge condemned him for behaving as if he were untouchable. She told Carrick, the malign influence of men like you in positions of power stands in the way of a revolution of women's dignity. Well, I'll allow you to get, to get some yeah. close. What is it you're searching for? The morning police finally caught up with David Carrick. He wasn't wearing his uniform, but even then he carried on acting as though he was above the law. So, I've been a police officer for 20 years. Right. 
But for those 20 years, while he should have been preventing crimes, he was committing them, carrying out a brazen, relentless campaign of sexual abuse, all the while telling women they could trust him because he was a police officer. David Carrick is guilty of at least 71 separate sexual offences. Today, he received 36 life sentences, meaning he'll spend at least three decades in jail. These convictions represent a spectacular downfall for a man charged with upholding the law. In a televised sentencing, Mrs Justice Chima Grubb told Carrick he'd caused irretrievable devastation in the lives of the women he raped and abused. Behind a public appearance of propriety and trustworthiness, you took monstrous advantage of women drawn into intimate relationships with you. You brazenly raped and sexually assaulted many women, some you barely knew. You behaved as if you were untouchable. David Carrick sat in the dock with his head bowed and his eyes lowered, occasionally shaking his head as the details of his crimes were read out. Some of his victims were sitting just a few metres away in the public gallery and after he'd been sentenced, they hugged each other and smiled. And police impunity. But no sentence today could be long enough to repair the damage that's been done to public trust in police. We in policing have failed. Uh, he should not have been a police officer. I know my words today aren't enough. People have heard me talk about plans and they're going to want to see the action that we take over forthcoming months and they will see that. At least one of Carrick's 12 victims believes the commissioner is telling the truth. The woman who we're calling Michelle is herself a serving Met police officer. She was a colleague of David Carrick's when he raped her in 2004. I've spent 20 years of my life um, with it, you know, hanging over me. Now I feel actually I can move on. You know, as a, an ex-police officer, it's never going to be easy in, in prison anyway. And um, he's taken away some of my years and hopefully now he'll see what it's like to sort of lose a big chunk of your life. For almost two decades, David Carrick got away with it. His job as a police officer was to help bring people to justice. Today, his victims finally got theirs. Chloe Keady, News at 10. What happened between the head of Epsom College and her husband on the night they died will probably never be known. Today, it's been reported that Emma Patterson made a distress call to a member of her family just before she was killed. Police now believe she was shot by her husband, George, as was their seven-year-old daughter, before he shot himself. His gun was found near their bodies. Mr Patterson had only been in touch with the police a few days ago about changing the address on his gun licence after the family had moved to Epsom. An answer to what that Chinese balloon was up to when it was flying over the United States has come a bit closer. The US Navy has released photos of bits of the balloon being recovered from the sea off the coast of Southern Carolina. It was shot down on Saturday. Debris from the balloon is scattered in about 50 feet of water. Now, the Prime Minister used the reshuffle he was compelled to make after sacking Nadim Zahawi to reshape several government departments around pressing priorities. Energy becomes a separate department again, with Grant Shapps in charge. The new Conservative chairman replacing Mr Zahawi is Greg Hans, a trade minister, a safe pair of... You know the joke, Mr Sunak's deputy and ally, Dominic Raab, stays put. And in another reminder of Conservative problems that won't go away, the BBC chairman, Richard Sharp, was grilled by MPs about whether he helped secure Boris Johnson alone. The most under-pressure member of the Cabinet, Dominic Raab, was not moved on in this reshuffle. But the party does have a new chair and Greg Hans is sure of one thing. Are your taxes in order? Sharp, 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 Good morning, they most definitely are. Good morning, how are you? Do you think you can win the next election? Of course we will. We can and we will. Appointed after the sacking of Nadim Zahawi over his taxes, Greg Hans now finds himself in charge of the election campaign. Elsewhere, this was a reshuffle that saw all the big beasts stay in place, but government departments reorganised. Mr Speaker, I did check that my department still exists before coming along today, and, uh, <laughs> and you'll be pleased to know that the great ship of state that is the Treasury sails serenely on.
Other departments might not feel quite so serene as Rishi Sunak has merged or created four new ones. Former Business Secretary Grant Shapps heads the new Energy, Security and Net Zero department. Kemi Badenoch adds business to her trade brief. Former Culture Secretary Michelle Donnellan heads up the new Science, Innovation and Technology department. And Lucy Fraser takes on the Slim Down Culture, Media and Sport department. Will there have to be another reshuffle, Mr Raab? The bullying investigation into Dominic Raab has yet to conclude, but the Prime Minister hinted his future is far from secure. When I'm presented with conclusive independent findings that someone in my government has not acted with the integrity or standards that I would expect of them, I won't hesitate to take swift and decisive action. That's what I've done in the past. But with regard to this situation, it's right that we let the independent process continue. This was not a radical reshuffle, but the Prime Minister's attempt to focus attention on what he wants to do with the job. The problem for this number 10 administration is that it still can't free itself from the tangled web of a previous one. Good morning, Mr Sharp. Boris Johnson's relationship with Richard Sharp was under renewed scrutiny today. The BBC chair telling MPs that the then PM knew he was applying for the BBC job and helping him with a loan from his cousin, Sam Blythe. But you did, in effect, inform the Prime Minister. I definitely informed that the Prime Minister. I informed the Prime Minister who had approached Blythe. you who wanted to lend him money to support his lifestyle. Well, I, I informed, yes, I informed the Prime Minister that Mr Blythe wanted to meet the Cabinet Secretary to see whether he could help the Prime Minister. And the implication of that is whether he could help him financially? Yeah, he definitely. Mr Sharp insists he did nothing wrong, but as with Dominic Raab, it's unfinished business hanging over the Prime Minister, desperately trying to move on. Romley Weeks, News at 10. Well, the focus on new energy and net zero department seemed timely after BP became the second big British-based oil and gas company to announce record profits running into billions, fueled by the runaway prices that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused. The company made £23 billion in profit last year. It paid £1.8 billion in tax in the UK. While its profits are up, BP has also run into trouble for announcing a fall in its emissions targets. The sun just won't stop shining for BP. The war Russia started a year ago sent energy prices into orbit, along with BP's profits. The company's shareholders are in rapture, its customers are not. 23 billion and they've got to charge pr prices like this after what's going on in the world. That's a liberty. Yes, I think it's pretty disgusting considering how high the bills have gone up and considering the effect that also having on the climate. The market price of oil and gas has eased recently, but BP expects both to remain elevated for years to come. This is a wave BP wants to ride, and higher profits should mean more investment. BP says by 2030 it will spend an extra £6.7 billion on solar, wind, biofuel and hydrogen projects, as well as electric vehicle charging points and convenience stores. Over the same period, it will increase investment in oil and gas extraction by the same amount. Last year, BP produced the equivalent of 2.3 million barrels of oil every day. By 2030, the company says that will fall to 2 million, but BP had pledged to cut oil and gas production to one and a half million barrels a day in seven years' time. BP insists it's still heading for net zero. Its chief executive says the last year has shown it will take time for us to wean ourselves off our dependence on oil and gas. The world wants and needs a better and a more balanced energy system, one that can deliver more secure, more affordable, as well as lower carbon energy solutions. During last year, extraordinary sums of money fell into BP's lap as a result of the war in Ukraine. Generally speaking, the company used its record profits for 2022 to reduce debt and reward shareholders. Of course, it could have decided to use the money to ramp up investment in renewables, but chose not to. Climate campaign groups accuse BP shareholders of putting pressure on the company to maximise profits in the short term. They argue the transition away from fossil fuels isn't happening fast enough. It's not just BP, though. It's the whole industry that's going to have to cut production if we're going to have any chance of meeting our climate goals and, more importantly, avoiding the worst impacts. 
Mega profits aren't popular, but they can help finance change. And we need companies to deliver on their promises if catastrophic levels of global warming is to be avoided. Joel Hills, News at 10. Well, fashion designer Stella McCartney knows a thing or two about what looks good on. Well, today she told us she was so pleased with her CBE that she will wear it every single day. It was awarded to her by the King at a ceremony at Windsor Castle. She said she felt very proud and honoured and she said her dad, Sir Paul, did too. The football fairy tale for Wrexham and the club's film star owners ended tonight in the FA Cup. Once again, there was plenty of drama in the replay against Sheffield United, who are three leagues above them. This time, though, Pedigree just won out over passion. Wrexham, Wrexham, Wrexham. Stand aside, the Reds are coming. Thousands of Wrexham fans made the trip over the Peak District to watch the Dragons try and make history against championship opposition. Wrexham AFC. Historically, Wrexham have always been a well-supported club, but this is something else. The buzz created by their Hollywood owners and a wildly successful documentary. So we need four scarves. This morning, back at the racecourse ground, it's business as usual at the club shop, and business is booming. The documentary has made stars of Wrexham's many colourful characters, including 98-year-old season ticket holder, Arthur. First game, I was 70 years old. I was in 1931. We met up with Arthur's family and friends before they travelled to Sheffield to watch their team try and make history. This team has got such a heart and um, I think they'll do their best to deliver if they can. It's going to be a tough game, but as long as we do our best, we'll have no complaints at all. But it was Sheffield United who made the better start and John McAtee broke the wrong goal. Surely he'd score. He goes in alone and misses. Oh dear, try as they might, the blades couldn't break Wrexham down. Rob Linton with this save from point-blank range. In the second half, the breakthrough finally came. Ahmed Hodjik blasting home to put Sheffield in front. He smashed it home! But this Wrexham side don't know when they're beaten. Star striker Paul Mullin drawing the foul and converting from the spot kick. It's Mullin! Never in doubt, was it? Never in doubt. A few minutes later, he was at it again. This time, though, it wasn't to be. It's saved by Davis. And how Wrexham would rue that miss. Billy Sharp breaking Welsh Hearts in the third minute of added time. Billy Sharp with a chance to win it and does. Before Wrexham conceded a third as they threw bodies forward for an equaliser. That's a wrap. So tonight there was to be no fairy tale ending for Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney's men. Sheffield United will play Tottenham Hotspur next while Wrexham travel home with their heads held high. Miss Williams, News at 10, Bramall Lane. Well, tonight, as we get ready to sign off on another News at 10, our thoughts turn back to Turkey and Syria, where we began tonight's programme, and where the number of dead has just risen again to 7,800. We can take you to some live images now, where very happily a sign of hope, a survivor who has just been drawn from the rubble. Workers will be committed to their extraordinary task throughout the night. Fires are burning to keep survivors warm. It's within the first three days of an earthquake that there is the most chance of finding and saving life, as we can see as we speak. Rescuers in these bleakest of situations call it golden time. This is golden time indeed. No wonder the digging and the hope does not stop. We'll have more from there throughout tomorrow, but from News at 10, that's it for tonight. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow.